Here is your county informational tape service for meetings in September. We have Devon Woodland here today, president of the National Farmers Organization. Devon, recently Willard Phillips, Jr., who is director of the Department of Agriculture's Office of Rural Development, told a convention of rural sociologists at Lexington, Kentucky, that what we need is a policy to expand the base, he said, of income for people who are now farming and develop their, I think he said, entrepreneurial um, aptitude. What do you think of a policy like that? Phil, it's a typical example of the non-thinking people that we have got in the administration and who are part of the public planning process. They're saying, let's develop um, both uh, tourism and recreation in the rural community. How many fishing ponds? How many uh, golf courses? How many trailer parks uh, <laughs> do you need per county? And then what's going to happen to the the uh, balance of the people, which will be far in majority. They're saying look for income in rural America from anything but farming or the sale of farm commodity. And it would appear that the end result would be that they would be going to the unemployment lines, they'd be going to the Social Security offices for their income. And they're saying all this to the people who are the most productive on the face of the earth, aren't they? Absolutely. And uh, they're saying that uh, this other type of farm income is now more important than farm programs. And the end result is they will eliminate farm programs and uh, cause these people to look for other sources of income for livelihood. What's the National Farmers Organization saying about this? Well, we think it's unconscionable that people would think in the same vein that the public planners, the department, the administration is thinking. Uh, it's totally irresponsible, inexcusable, and we uh, are diametrically opposed to this approach. How does the National Farmers Organization handle this pricing situation? There's only one reason, Phil, that a farmer uh, sells his farm, liquidates, uh, and it's simply because of farm income. Uh, he must have his costs of production. He must have income equal to those costs that he... Uh, invests in that farm and it can only come through organization and through bargaining and negotiating forward contracts and that's the role and the responsibility of the National Farmers Organization which we can be successful in doing when farmers are willing to unite sufficiently and if they in my opinion don't move rapidly that uh, someday they will wake up without enough strength to protect themselves. The livestock people of National Farmers Organization are holding meetings over key producing states. We have Walt Hackney here today, director of NFO Livestock Operations. How will the widespread drought affect feeder cattle? Feeder cattle are going to have a lot of opposition this fall because of the consensus that corn itself is going to be up around 3 or 3.50 a bushel at harvest time. A lot of people are anticipating that. But, Phil, I feel it's a misdemeanor on these calves because a calf brought in in the fall, uh, October, November, that calf isn't going to be physically tying in to very much grain per se. He'll be roughage. He'll be chopped hay. Uh, the calf will be grown two to three, maybe 400 pounds before that producer ever has to put in much concentrate of this higher priced uh, like corn. And consequently, uh, when he weighs 800, the producer can decide then, do I want to go with him or do I want to uh, feed him on out or sell him as a yearling steer? What about the spread in slaughter cattle between top good and choice? That's becoming a real problem. Uh, many of the cattle feeders uh, are currently into what they consider high priced corn. And they feel that if they can short feed these cattle or back up a little bit on the corn they're putting into them, it will make them a cheaper animal produced. It really isn't true, Phil, because what happens is the packing industry all of a sudden has a tremendous need for more choice, well-fed, hard cattle and a very much of a lesser degree uh, of a need for these lesser-fed kind of cattle. And consequently, it developed such a tremendous spread. Today, it's about eight or ten bucks a hundred between choice and goods. 
you could feed on that kind of a spread, you could feed corn costing up to $4 a bushel, and it would certainly pay you to do it. Walt Hackney of NFO Livestock. Now here is Al Scott of the Dairy Department with a note on government policy affecting dairy producers. It appears that President Reagan will veto the House and Senate resolution to delay the second 50 cent tax until October 1st. This then will send out signals to the House and Senate saying that the only thing that the present administration is concerned about is to get in the $1.4 billion that dairy farmers will pay in the next year. This in turn will force many dairy farmers into selling their herds and their farms. Our leaders have not learned from the history of this world. Even in the Bible it tells of the seven years of feast and the seven years of famine, and only the wise who had set aside a reserve to carry them through were able to survive. Today our leaders say we have surpluses and not reserves, and that we have too many farmers producing too much and that we must eliminate some of these productive people. Do you suppose they have a list with the names and addresses of those farmers that they want to eliminate? At this time, we can expect very little help from anyone. So if we want to get anything done, we had better start now. We can accomplish anything we want if enough of us work together. In the past year, the average pay price to dairy producers is eight cents higher than last year. The price of butter, powder, and cheese are down. National production is up. If we can have this effect with our present production, just think what we can do if we get more and more people involved. Our goal is to be able to pass the tax onto the buyers of dairy products. Is that what you want to do, too? John Brundage and Steve Andrews are two grain negotiators for national farmers. They can give us better informed insights into the trends in the grain market than anyone you might talk to. They have a ringside seat at the NFO's volume transactions in programmed marketing. Here's our conversation with John Brundage first. Okay, we're talking about mid-August. What have the NFO people been doing to try to counteract these ups and downs? Well, we've had a number of beans on the block, and as beans have been moving up, we've been uh, selling a little bit at a time as they go up to keep the uh, average price that the producer receives at a higher level. Is this what you call programmed marketing? Yes, Phil, that's right. We've been selling uh, new crop 83 beans for uh, harvest delivery and you know, out into the first quarter of 84 for uh, over nine dollars. Okay, I'm going to talk to Steve Andrews now. Uh, you've been in on some transactions in corn. Is it pretty much the same picture that John described? Yes, uh, we've moved corn up over three and a half uh, in certain areas up to 370 in other areas. NFO uh, grain has programmed marketing. We feel the best way to market your grain is continually selling on up markets instead of moving grain when they start going down. It's better to average out your price on an up market than trying to average it out on a down market. Steve Andrews of the Grain Department. We heard him and John Brundage, grain negotiators for NFO. Now to Jack Cruz, visiting with Sharon Strosheim of Brown County, South Dakota. Here's Cruz in the country. How large a farm do you and your husband run? Well, we run a cow-calf operation and a grain operation, a couple thousand acres. Now on the cow-calf operation, how many cows uh, do you run a year? Uh, we like to, uh, in a given year, we uh, raise about 250 calves. We split our herds. We have a... Uh, uh, 125 come in in the spring, and then we have 125 that come in in the fall to eliminate all the work being done in the spring. Plus, it also uh, promises two paychecks a year instead of just one. All right. And you have a lot of grain that you raise, is that right? Yes, we have as much grain as we do cattle. We uh, raise uh, wheat and oats, flax, corn, and uh, occasionally millet. Now, do you sell some of your grain through the national farmers? We sell every bushel we own through the National Farmers Organization. 
do you do you come down here uh, on a regular basis to with your livestock? Oh yes, every head of livestock we own also goes through the Columbia Collection Point. We're talking about the National Convention, and it seems as though there's quite a bit of interest uh, in this area for uh, Denver. They said it's within the realm. They're planning to take a bus, I believe, that they're talking about. Is that right? We're either going to take a bus or several campers and caravan down there. We've done that before and find that quite enjoyable. How many uh, members do you think you'll get from Brown County to go to the National Convention this year? Well, I guess if we could get as many as we want, you know, we'd like to have like 15 or 20 couples. Be 40 people uh, going to the convention. So who kind of ramrods uh, convention plans here to, to get the members to go? I guess you're talking to her right now. I'm usually the head of the convention, uh, getting the bus or the airplane or the accommodations or the room. I send in, uh, I take care of those things. So we've decided for the last couple years, we offer to pay part of the expenses for young couples or couples who are going for the first time. Uh, whatever our treasury will bear at the time, and we look at like a minimum of $100 that we will give to that couple or uh, the group that will go for the first time or, or it's particularly the young farmers who really need the help to get there. This is, uh, comes out of the county treasury, is that right? Yes, it does. And uh, because we have quite an active county and because we do have some successful fundraisers, we usually do have ample money to uh, give to the people that want to go. Thank you very much for talking to us. You bet. Jack Cruz, Columbia, South Dakota. There are a lot of good plans like this coming out of the counties for getting delegates to Denver. See you there, November 28th through December 1st. We have presented your county informational tape service for September meetings. Edited and compiled by Don Mack, director of the NFO Broadcast Division. I'm Phil Allen. And that for this month is something to think about.